Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started here in just a minute or two. Um, so glad to see some more familiar faces back today. And if you want to, go ahead and take a moment in the chat, say hi. Let us know people know that you're here, a little bit about who you are, anything you want to share there in the chat. And by getting started, I guess that one minute went by really fast, George. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the second day of our 2020 Institute for Science and Policy Symposium. I am Kristen Uhlenbrock, and I am part of the Institute for Science and Policy team. So great to have many of you coming back here if you joined us on Tuesday or if this is your first day joining us, we're so glad to have you. I am joined this morning by George Sparks, the president and CEO of the Nivru Museum of Nature and Science and the founder of the Institute for Science and Policy. Good morning, George. Good morning, Kristen. Great. And if you all missed, George had a wonderful intro remarks on our first day. We already have that video on the website. Um, so if you want to go back and check out George's remarks or any of our speakers or panels from day one, we have those videos already posted. Thanks to my dear colleague Trent for being quick on the draw there with that. Um, so the, those are on the Institute website. And we're going to tell you just a little bit about today. Uh, today's schedule is a mere reflection of, of Tuesdays. Um, so we'll have a little bit of an intro here followed by a panel, um, breakout sessions from 10.15 to 10.45 Mountain Time. We'll be coming back here to the live main stage at 11 for another panel and then a closing keynote conversation as well. So again, I if this is a, your first time here today or if this is your second, hopefully you're feeling like a pro on Hopin. My advice on Tuesday was you cannot break it, you know? So it's a new platform. Um, we encourage you, if you haven't been on Hopin before, to just explore it um, type in a chat, find someone to send a private message to. We have sessions here on the left hand side and that's where you'll want to go when we do our breakout sessions um, here a little bit later this morning. We have networking. So if you had the opportunity to participate in that this morning already um, or did not, we will be back at one o'clock uh, mountain time this afternoon and you can pop in there. And that's a really great thing where it pairs you up with someone else randomly and you get to have about a five minute conversation with them. So kind of bumping into someone at the water cooler experience. And of course, we've got an expo hall there. But any of our live main stage programming will be right here at that stage button where it seems that most of you are already hanging out. Um, we also have, of course, some polls. So we have some new polls for today if you want to check them out over there and fill out some of your responses. We have some climate related polls and some polls about information. So our main theme for the symposium, as you're well aware of, is untangling complexity in our changing world. And on Tuesday, we spent the day being a little reflective and thinking big picture, where we talked about the philosophy of science, trust, and human nature as it relates to shaping policy. Today, we're going to get a little bit more focused and we'll also be reflective and reflective on 2020, but we're also planning to take a view ahead. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit about how does all this come into play when we think about the role of science as it relates to climate change policy, both in light of this past year, 2020, which is a big year, lots of things have gone on this year, as well as what does it provide for us as a forward looking path ahead. So we have a really great line of experts that bring expertise in climate. We're also gonna be talking about the media, misinformation and the role of the media and how we as humans consume and receive our information has been brought up in almost every session and discussion we've had. It comes up all the time. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that in our panel a little bit later this morning um, at 11 o'clock mountain time, um, one o'clock Eastern time. So this morning I just wanna have a, a little bit of a conversation with George and spend some time with him reflecting on Tuesday, some things that he heard or resonated with him and, and maybe we'll move into and, and talk a little bit about today's theme about climate as well too. But, but George, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, what resonated with you, something that stuck out from Tuesday. Yeah, Kristen, uh, I think the big thing that stuck out for me was what we've all said over and over again is, even though this is the Institute about for Science and Policy, it ain't about the science, it's really about people. And uh, yesterday you heard words like community, common good, uh, mommy group, uh, bringing 30 people to a council. So 
for me, that reinforced this fact that each and every one of us have power. Uh, we probably have more than we think we do, whether we're an individual or a neighborhood or a city. Everything doesn't have to be done by the government at the highest level. And then the, the other aha was, again, this it was about emotions, trust and value, biases and belief systems. And I love Elke's comment, uh, believing is seeing. I think we, we see a lot of that around things like climate or COVID or the elections. And, uh, and, and we're all susceptible to it. My the most important book I've ever read, and I really recommend it to people, is Jonathan Haidt's book called The Righteous Mind. And the subtitle is, How Can Honorable People Be So Divided by Politics and Religion? And, and again, it's, uh, he uses this metaphor that each one of us is an elephant and a rider, and the elephant is, is emotion, and uh, the rider is reason. And we think the rider is in control, but the, but the elephant's really in control. And we make decisions emotionally and then try to justify them with reason. Uh, and we see that every day, and we all do it. So that, to me, were those two things are the big takeaways from yesterday. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I really am fascinated about Elke, and I want to talk a little bit about seeing us believing, but I want to um, also talk a little bit about what you started talking about there, about kind of the power that any individual holds and holds in that role within community. And, and I remember one of our speakers had said that our sphere of influence is bigger than we think it is, mm -hmm. and how, you know, we often look to maybe leadership at the national or global level, but you yourself can be a leader in your own community. You can get, I think it was Aitan Hirsch, who's a political scientist who said, you know, you and 30 people heading into your local city council can have a really huge impact. And so it's kind of a little bit of where the rubber meets the road. And George, you and I were talking a little bit about this yesterday, and we were actually talking about it in the context of where do we get information, and we were talking about Twitter. And as soon as I got done talking with you, George, I went on Twitter. And um, <laughs> I, you know, and, and I'm actually not on Twitter that often, and I, I got on yesterday evening. And to be honest with you, I found this beautiful quote of someone that I wanted to share because it reflects a little bit about this personal role of being a leader. And so it was a quote actually from the Harvard Kennedy School, just at the top of my feed. And they were quoting Prime Minister uh, Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand. Um, and they wrote that she said, you do not have to have personal ambition to be a leader. You do not have to be the loudest person in the room. You can believe in consensus more than you believe in conflict. You can be human. You can feel and show emotion. You can be kind, empathetic, and strong. And I just thought it was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, you're very much a leader. I see you as a leader. Um, I see a lot of other people who are not in your a position such as you as being leaders. I'm wondering, if, uh, you know, what are some of your thoughts about, you know, who 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 can be a leader? Who should be a leader? How do you how do people um, realize that they are own individual leaders in their own right within their, their communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this. Uh... By the way, I would start off by saying that I thought that that discussion yesterday between uh, Jandell Allen Davis and Dan Sarowitz and, and Corey Flintoff, what Jandell had to say about leadership, I, I really encourage everybody, if you didn't see it, go back and watch it. It's, it made me think a lot. And I, uh, she's one of the most fabulous people that I know. And it was a wonderful um, example of leadership at the at that level that will spread out beyond this because everybody was on that call yesterday heard what she had to say so I, I think everybody on this call can be a leader things that you learn here if you you can post them on your social media feed you can just talk to other people around the water cooler each and every one of the people on this call are blessed and that we are part of the educated elite and we need to do really take that pretty seriously as we go out and talk to, to other folks. And we need to do it with humility. I think a lot of times we get a lot of feedback that just because we have an education, we look down our nose at other people and we need to do that with empathy. Uh, I saw something the other day that uh, um, denigrating the uneducated is the last safe prejudice. And uh, Everybody on this call can be a leader, an empathetic leader, as opposed to just a, you know, an influential leader. Yeah. So another point you were talking about, um, and you know, building on today's theme about climate and, and leadership when it comes to climate solutions. You know, we're going to end today talking about 
the role of bipartisanship in climate. Um, you know, we've also been talking about, and I don't think people know this, but we originally, you know, before the pandemic, when we were talking about this year's symposium, we were thinking about that continuum of local to global um, and where, you know, where does individual action or solutions lie within that continuum? And it kind of is a yes, all the above. But George, I wonder if you want to spend a little bit of time reflecting on some ideas or some thinking that you've had recently when it comes to thinking about climate change and a path forward, you know, where does that sit, whether that's in the scientific or the policy landscape on that continuum from local to global solutions? Yeah, I, I, being an engineer and a scientist and a business person, uh, when you see a problem like climate change or COVID, you immediately go to a large scale, top down approach to it and, okay, we're smart, we know what to do. Everybody will just do what we want to do. We can solve this. And unfortunately, it rarely works that way. And, uh, you know, Colorado passed uh, Senate Bill 1261, the climate change bill. And I was a little skeptical of that, frankly, because Colorado only emits 3% of the US CO2 emissions. And, and uh, we're gonna spend a lot of time and money to, to work on that. And then I read an article called How to Fix the Climate in the Boston Review. And it, it compared the Kyoto Protocol to the Paris Protocol to the Montreal Protocol. And you may not know what Montreal is. Montreal is the one around CFCs and, and ozone. The Kyoto Protocol was very tops down. It said, okay, everybody has to do this. We'll punish you if you don't meet these goals. And it failed. Paris took the opposite approach and said, hey, everybody come. Do what you can. We'll work together. These aren't hard and fast. These aren't aren't hard and fast uh, limits. Let's work together. And that, frankly, hasn't been working very well either. Now, Montreal is the notable exception that really did work. And what they set up there was they didn't really know the answer. They didn't really know how much how many uh, how much CFCs they had to cut out of the environment to save the ozone hole. But they said, we have a problem, let's work on it together. And they set up a very soft touch. They call it experimentalist governance. And the idea was, hey, let's work together on this. You try this, I'll try that. If my thing works, maybe you can adopt it. Uh, they they uh, actually helped other nations that didn't have the resources to, uh, to work on their problem. And it's the most su successful environmental worldwide movement that we've ever had. And I, I think there's a lot to be learned from this. So I, I think we should post that uh, the link to that article. It's, uh, it's very, very well done. And it gave me encouragement that things that we do individually, like, uh, you know, driving less can make a difference if, if, if we touch, again, touch people's emotions, as opposed to trying to be really ultra rational and laying out laws. And it gave me increased hope that Colorado can be an example for other places. And we can probably learn from other places what to do better in Colorado. So uh, take a look at that article in the, in the, on the website. Yeah, I just dropped that link in there. It's a really great article. I highly recommend it. It's, it, it gave me a lot to think about too, this um, experimentalist governance model, right? Of both the, the top down and the bottom up and that they both serve important roles, but there is, you know, this idea that the bottom up even has a very much more important role, particularly when it comes to actionable on the ground, you know, anticipating, you know, challenges, adapting to the challenges. Um, and that really does happen at that local level. I think we see that often too right now playing out with the pandemic, right? And, you know, guidance coming from the top, but where does implementation come from, right? And it's often that role of local communities and I know this has been talked about. I was hearing something on CPR this morning when it comes to the rollout of the vaccine. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's often those in the communities really do kind of have a little bit better grasp in hand of what is needed um, to help support their community. And so it's, it's finding that balance of both that kind of higher level overarching governance, but a lot of that, you know, leadership coming from the bottom tier too and from that ground up, so to speak, um, makes me think a little bit of the, you know, what some people have been talking about earlier on with COVID, you know, with, with an ax approach, you now coming in a little bit more with that scalpel approach. It kind of draws similar parallels in my mind that to that mm -hmm. way too, right? That you can apply that scalpel a little bit more easily um, when you are down at a more localized level and it, it matters to the people in the community. 
So George, any other final thoughts for you before we, we head off for today? Where you know, climate's a big theme today, but we also are talking about um, the role of media and misinformation. So any final thoughts on that before we wrap up this morning's conversation? Well, I'm really excited about this team. Uh, we've, got, we've got some of the folks that I admire more than just about anybody else in the environmental movement here, Carlos and Allison. I've never met Catherine, but I'm her biggest fan on her Energy Gang podcast. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, so uh, we've got a great lineup. So thank you, Kristen, for, for creating this and, and go for it, folks. Have, have a awesome. great time. Thanks, George. Now you got to meet Catherine real briefly right here. I know you guys haven't had a chance to meet her. <laughs> Thanks for being my big biggest fan. Yeah, no, no, I have. I, you guys do such a great job. For two years, I've listened to nearly every single episode of your podcast. Well, thank you. That's an honor. Thanks, George. Okay, bye. Have a good time. Thank you.